Okay, good evening and thank you for joining us for uh, this talk regarding the uh, Seeing the Invisible project, which is an augmented reality contemporary art exhibition currently on view in uh, 12 botanical gardens around the globe. Here with me today are Ori Gersh and Timur Sikin, two of the artists who have created uh, new works specifically for the project and will discuss the process of creating the works and the experience of exhibiting works in a botanical garden uh, through an augmented reality app. Seeing the Invisible is an exhibition uh, initiated by the Jerusalem Botanical Gardens in partnership with Outset Contemporary Art Fund and the support of the Jerusalem Foundation. The exhibition is actually a um, groundbreaking project collaborating between various botanical gardens around the world, contemporary uh, artists working around the globe and, uh, and it's co-curated by myself and Pal Michael Haring, which uh, we're both uh, based in Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, the project uh, began uh, on the backdrop of the pandemic and of people seeking to experience art outside of the uh, uh, historically uh, accepted uh, venues for uh, viewing art, museums, galleries, exhibition spaces, and so forth. The idea was to examine the situation of experiencing art outside and trying to uh, to examine this through the collaboration between high-end uh, technology and high-end uh, artistic uh, creation. The exhibition uh, deals with notions relating to, um, to of course, uh, art. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit uh, excited about this uh, situation currently. Um, ecology sustainability and issues relating to uh, ecological aspects through various works of art which were created specifically for the exhibition. The exhibition includes, one second, an amazing list of artists from around the globe, including Ai Weiwei from China, uh, Jacob Kutstinson from Denmark, Sarah Miochos from the United States, Rafika Nadal from Turkey, Dato Manabe from Japan, Pamela Rosenkratz from Switzerland, Elena Tsui from Ghana, Mohamed Kazam from the uh, United Arab Emir Emirates, Melo Callahan from Australia, and Sigalit Landau from Israel. And of course, Ori Gersh, uh, Israeli artist based in England for many years, and Timur Sikrin, uh, based in the USA. The process uh, uh, of creating the exhibition included uh, engaging with each of the artists separately and thinking how to create a work of art which can be um, experienced through um, the augmented reality uh, application. We created an app specifically for the exhibition. We did not rely on any existing application. And the reason was we wanted the project to be uh, 
specifically available only upon visiting the different gardens. So we actually call for the visitors to come into the gardens, experience the gardens, and at one and the same time, locate and experience the various artworks. The, The works, uh, upon entering a garden, the application recognizes where the visitor is around the world and brings up a map, a GPS map of the specific garden in which the visitor uh, is. In this map, uh, various, uh, there is a path, and as in any GPS map, as in Google Maps or any other application, the visitor is invited to follow the route. The route is a cyclical route for each and uh, every garden, uh, presenting the various works. It's the same corpus of 13 works in each of the gardens, only augmented into the various backgrounds. It looks different and it, it is experienced differently in each of the gardens. Uh, the visitors can only experience the works through a, a device, may it uh, be a, a cell phone or an, a, an iPad or any type of a tablet. Um, and they have to walk the gardens locate the art artworks and establish them in the gardens. After establishing the work, the viewer realizes the connection between the physical presence of his or her own uh, body in the garden and the establishing of the work. In many cases, uh, the presence of the body actually affects the way the work is um, established and the, uh, and the various aspects which occur in the work during uh, its uh, process. As a curator, I've been uh, uh, focusing for many, many years in, uh, on site-specific works uh, uh, presented in usually white cube spaces. The idea is to create a work which relates to the space where it is located and for uh, the viewer to engage with the work, not only through the gaze, but through the physical movement in space. Curating this project, along with Tal Michael Herring, gave me the opportunity to try and examine a new, a new situation, which is very typical of the current uh, uh, state of affairs in the world. The situation is for a physical body to be present in a certain space, but for the work to be presented in a digital manner. This duality between being physically present at, at a specific spot and having to be in that spot in order to view the work, as you cannot view it from home, you cannot view it from a different garden or a different park in the world, and experiencing the work in a totally digitally manner uh, resonates a term which uh, actually was born during the pandemic, during the corona pandemic, which is the digital, the combination of the, of the physical and the digital. So it allowed uh, me as a curator to examine the notion of site-specific works in a manner which is both the most site-specific as it cannot be uh, experienced in any other manner, but it's non-existent in a way as it is only digital. And this duality is very, very fascinating. It's also mind-boggling for the viewer to walk around, uh, around the garden, establish a work, see it, be able to walk 300 and, uh, 360 degrees around it, take photos with family members, friends, etc., which relate to the work. And then actually, as soon as the, as the eyes are uh, off the screen, see that there's nothing there in reality. I think the best works in the exhibition are the type of works which actually take the viewer into a journey through uh, the process of the work. Such are the works of Ori and of Timur who will speak about their works. And such are also the, uh, some of the works um, like those of Ai Weiwei, Mel O'Callaghan, or Dato Manabo, which I would like to present uh, to you uh, soon. For instance, in Ai Weiwei's work, which is called uh, Golden Cage, Gilded Cage, I'm sorry, the viewer is invited to establish the work and see this huge gilded cage. Upon entering the cage, the viewer can actually walk the different cells within the cage and have the turning doors in it react to the bodily presence of the viewer and enable him or her to walk through the circular path within the work. I'm looking for the video one second, perhaps I missed it. We'll find the video in, in a moment uh, here.
So you see an example of how the app operates and how the viewer can actually walk around the work physically, seemingly to physically enter the cage. And of course, experience what it feels like to be in a gilded cage from inside to gaze outwards and from the outside to gaze inside inwards. And to think about the metaphor of a gilded cage within a botanical garden, which is a sort of gilded cage for the plants, which are uh, uh, grown in the garden for scientific research and uh, botanical uh, preservation. So that's one example. Um, in this sense, the whole uh, backdrop of the theoretical uh, uh, consideration of the exhibition takes upon the notions of site and non-site, taking on from the 1970s and Robert Smithson's uh, a series of works uh, titled Site, Non-Site, in which he transferred geological uh, rocks and, and, and earth from one spot to the other into the white cube and asking the question of uh, relevance of positioning the body in relation to what would be the art object then and what is a digital uh, art object now. Or we will discuss his work uh, soon. Here we can see the work of Melo Callahan. Melo Callahan is an Australian artist who created this uh, huge uh, glass sphere in, into which the viewer is invited to enter and to walk into. And the work examines the manner in which sound and visual uh, effects can cause a state of, um, um, of trance. It's a continuation of physical works, which the artist that has pre presented previously in various museums around the world. Only in the physical uh, presentations of the work, there was this, a group of uh, experienced performers who operated the work. Here, we invite the viewers to enter the sphere, experience the work, consider the tension between outside and inside, real and imaginary, physical and digital. From the inside, the sphere is like a lens. It's, it distorts everything that uh, happens around it. And then we have this breathing process occurring through the work, affecting the viewer as well. Usually we tend to accommodate ourselves to the rhythm of breath or the sounds that are uh, encompassing us. And then walk out of the sphere and it's complete silence. Of course, you can only hear the, the sound effects of the work while in the sphere and see the visual effects only while in the sphere. I think this work by Mel is exactly the work of Timur, who will discuss his work soon, offer a journey for the viewer to enter a, a whole sphere, a whole, a whole experience, which is a, a quite total and absolute and, a, and mind blowing. And to have a totally new experience of, um, of the engagement with the art object that we usually would in a physical exhibition space. We have some additional examples. I'm just going through all the works so you can visually see them. And we would uh, see a short uh, presentation also of Daito Manabe, um, the Japanese artist, who created a work based upon his own, um, his own presence. Daito's work uh, began with him going into, we'll see it and then I will say perhaps a sentence or two.
So in Daito's work, actually, it was based on an MRI, uh, brain MRI that he uh, asked uh, to go through. And while being within the uh, MRI, he thought about various dance movements. Then with the results of the MRI, with the data received from it, he worked through an artificial intelligence program trying to reincorporate the thoughts into actual movement. And with a 3D scanning of his own body, he created this movement, his bodily presence with movements, which physically, of course, are not uh, uh, possible for the human body currently, for the joints and for gravity uh, aspects. Uh, so it's a whole circle beginning from the physical body researching it, taking the information through a ver a, a various stages of digital uh, translation and manifestation, and creating the work uh, at the end. If we have time at the end, I will show you a, a video of a dancer. We had a dancer go into the Jerusalem Botanical Gardens in Israel and dance in accordance to uh, the, the uh, presence of Daito Manabe. And it's, it was amazing to see the correlation between real and digital uh, bodies. Uh, and we have a work by Isaac Julian, who, which was uh, actually translated into the medium of uh, AR, not uh, created especially for the uh, exhibition, Stones Against Diamonds. And perhaps I will take us, if I'm, if I'm able, able, one second. Uh, also to a quick video which uh, uh, summarizes the exhibition and then we can go to uh, the presentations of uh, Ori and Timor. I can say in the backdrop of that, that the exhibition is currently in view in uh, different countries, different continents. Uh, of course, the Edinburgh Botanical Garden, Royal Botanical Gardens, which is uh, hosting us in this conversation this evening, but also in Canada, in Australia, in Israel, in England in the, with the Eden Project, in South Africa. Uh, so it really uh, is groundbreaking in the spread uh, of it and in the type of uh, collaboration it enabled us. Okay. Thank you for taking the time uh, and joining us. And I think I'll pass to Ori, who will uh, give us some background about the creation of his work and that, and the process of creating it towards the exhibition. Okay. So I'll just share my screen. Okay. So I'm starting with a, a slide of three painting by Jan Bruegel the Elder that um, this was the inspiration for the piece that I created. And <clears throat> I work with these um, paintings as reference for quite some time. I produce another body of works that I um, titled on Reflection, which I'll come into in a minute. But I think that the reason I'm interested in this particular work and particular period is that this work where uh, these paintings were created at the beginning of the 17th century between 1600 and 1610. This is the beginning, more or less, of the scientific revolution. And it has fundamental implication and impact on the way flower paintings were created. And not just this, on the old perception of um, the botanical world and the natural world. So around this period, um, 
there was the uh, it was the moment of the introduction of horticulturalism and what apparent in painting from this moment onward, and these were the first painting actually to represent it, that old wild flower completely disappeared from compositions. And every flower that you see in each one of those compositions could not exist without human intervention, without some botanical genetic intervention. This is one thing. And another thing that I found particularly fascinating about this work is that Although on first sight, you get a sense that Peter Bruegel was standing or sitting in front of those bouquets and was painting what he saw in front of him. That this is an absolute natural, natural naturalistic representation of those bouquets, but this is completely wrong. These flowers were blooming at different, at different time of the year, therefore he was unable to paint them together. He painted each flower individually and created those composition, and if you look at more of his painting, you, it's very apparent that some of the flowers are appearing exactly the same position in other paintings, so you reuse them. So once again, there is a sense of naturalism, but nothing is natural about this work. And the third point, which I find very, uh, very fascinating, is that um, when you're looking at those bouquets, this was the beginning of imperialism, and I'll talk about it in a second, but Europeans start to reach, to outreach to distant places around the world, and they brought um, exotic specimens. So all the flowers that you see here are not necessarily European flowers. These are flowers that are coming from Iran and from Turkey, like the, like the tulip, for example. And all of a sudden, they're appearing in a single vase. So it's not just the illusion of time. There is also an illusion of space here. The vase become the center of authority and the sort of the European center, but what you see could never exist together. So this come very close to our idea of the virtual reality and the augmented realities that the work is about. This relationship that exists between, between, <clears throat> between reality or what we perceive as real and a sense of representation. And in all my work for, 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 for the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, I'm exploring those relationships. Our technology is transforming the relationships that we have with the world, with a sense of representation and perception. And uh, to talk about it, what's happening here? Okay, to talk about it, I just want to kind of give a couple of ideas or to explore a couple of ideas in relation to this moment of the 17th and 18th century, the scientific revolution, which I see a very close analogy to the time we're living in today, eh, which is the digital revolution. At these moments, this is Galileo looking at the stars through a lens. Again, we're talking about 1607, 1610, and all of a sudden, the lens become an extension to his eyes and he's able to see things that were unattainable to the human eye to this point. And all of a sudden, he does not refer to the moon as a perfect celestial body, but he is able through those lenses that becoming an extension to the eye. It's the first time that the lens becoming allowing us to, to peek to peek into spaces that were unattainable, that are going beyond the naked eye's capability. He was able to see shadows and light and produce those drawings through his kind of artistic um, training and, ex and show a moon that was full of craters that was imperfect like planet Earth. Up to this point, people believe that only planet Earth it was imperfect because of our moral, um, um, poor moral standard as human being. <clears throat> this is Levinock. At the same time, he started to look through the microscope and he started to see organisms that were unattainable to the human eye. So all of a sudden, the large and the small being compressed and we were able to expand and kind of perceive reality that is only up to this point were un, um, unperceivable. It's conceptually available to us through the lenses. And as soon as we process this information, we can no longer go back to the reality that we live in before. And this is the reality from before. So you're looking here at Jan Bruegel, the elder again. And this is another painting of his, not flower this time, but the Garden of Eden. And this was the perception before Galileo and Levinov, before this moment of revolution. People believe 
that there was one moment of creation. And since this moment, nothing exceed and nothing came, meaning the world was in equilibrium. All the organism and all the flower were more or less in proportion to our bodies as human beings. So this is kind of completely being broken at this particular moment. And I'm talking about this in, um, I, I'll give you an example. So this is a, a maggot looking through a microscope and all of a sudden a new world is uh, becoming possible through optical intervention. Now, <clears throat> that's maybe you want to show um, the video or maybe I'll show a couple of more actually and then, and then we get into it. So here I work on the, um, the on reflection a body of works that later participate also in the AR. So I, I made a, a piece related based on, on, on the same uh, flowers and the same painting. And what I've done here, I created a series of photographs where I made those bouquets based on the painting, a three-dimensional object with sculptures and again. And then I built a kaleidoscopic studio made out of mirrors. And what I've done then, I shattered the mirrors rather than exploded the flowers. So you stand and you're looking at photograph here that is not of the object itself, but of the you're looking at a reflection of the object. And what I've done when I photograph them, I use two cameras beside each other. One camera was focusing on the reflection in the mirror, and the second camera standing beside it was focusing on the mirror itself. So there are two surfaces, two optic, sorry, two optical points. One is the reflection, which is the virtual space, and the second is the material, the physical space, the physical mirror itself as an object. And when I photograph, because the focusing point is different, I capture two parallel reality. This one is the virtual. So the mirror shutter, but because I focus on the reflection in the mirror, which optically is much further into the space, what starts to happen here, that instead of having one mirror, which I started with, I have hundreds of mirrors. So you see that the shelf is broken at the bottom. You see that some of the flowers, like the red flower, which is a peony, reappearing in many different places because it's reflect multiple times, but you can't see the glass at all, or you may be able to see it at the top right corner because the glass is out of focus. And all that appear here is the virtual space, the virtual reality at the moment of the mirror shattering. The other photograph is capturing at exactly the same moment, but the focus here on the surface of the mirror. So the reflection is getting out of focus, but the surface itself becoming hyper clear. So you can see every detail here. So it's, the more you come close to the physical reality of the object, the further you move from its virtual presence and vice versa. The more you come close to the virtual presence, the further you move from its physical and you cannot attain it as a physical object. So when we move into the AR project that appear in the different botanical garden, for me, this kind of work presented a great opportunity to explore similar ideas. I particularly um, like the fact that those pieces are geolocated, meaning that I cannot see them in my studio, I cannot see them at home. I was making a work that I was unable to see until I visited the gardens themselves. Um, and simultaneously, this work does not exist anywhere. It's a, it's a phantom, it's a virtual image, but the relationships that now can be established between the physical and the virtual world, the fact that we can make those transformation and transcending from one space to another. And of course, this is very early stages. So when you experience this work, there is always a gap between the potential. And I remember working on the internet when we just started with HDMI and we were unable to use images, but we were dreaming the potential. This also happened with photography when it was invented in um, in 1856, Roger Fenton went to photograph the Crimean War and he was unable to photograph any movement of soldier fighting. So all his photographs were of landscape and cannonball where Manet around the same time painted the execution of Maximilian and he can show bullet leaving the, the barrel. So we are still a little bit in this space, but the potential is phenomenal where the boundaries between the virtual and the physical, which I try to achieve in the works that I created of on reflection start to melt down. I try to talk about the relationship or the, or the 
um, the tension and the polarity that existing between the virtual space and the physical space, all of a sudden in the AI environment, we are really start to move into a space that is in absolute flux, that there are no, no longer barriers and boundaries. I was working on a virtual reality project recently, and this sort of volumetric virtual project, meaning that everything was captured photographically and creating three-dimensional objects that are moving in space. And as soon as other senses will start to, uh, to, uh, to be included in those sort of um, environments, it will be very, very difficult for us to decipher and to make a distinguish between the two spaces. So I kind of think about it. And when I started making photographs, the conversation was about photography representing the world. And now I, start, I, I kind of conceive it as the world itself. So the virtual images are no longer representation, but they're becoming part of reality. And we are lo no longer able to make any distinction. There is an absolute meltdown between the physical and the virtual. Yeah. Sorry, I wanted to show. Yeah. So this is a, somebody experiencing the work and after the explosion of the flowers, interacting with the flower, somebody is photographing her from outside, but this sort of blend that exists between a physical experience and the virtual space is a, you know, my, my particular interest in, in those spaces and possibilities that are opening up. So perhaps, or if you stop share, I can uh, present the video of the work and for the viewers to experience in, in part. Um, yeah, just one second. Okay. And it's maybe also important to mention that the explosion occurs with regard to the presence of the viewer. One thing that I, I forgot to mention when I talk about the piece, that um, in, re in relation to the explosion, I invited three curators and art historian to look at the original Jan Bruegel, the, uh, the elder, and to describe the painting. And as soon as the explosion takes place, you hear them, they recorded themselves, reading the descriptions that they wrote. So you can actually wander in the space and move between one to another and each one of them occupy 120 degrees part of the circle. So as you move around, you go from one description to another. Some are talking about the names of the flowers. Some description is much more uh, conceptual, but each one of them is giving an account of the full memory of the painting that all of a sudden is kind of falling apart and all the petals are floating all over the garden in a, in, we created a perimeter of about eight meters. So you can actually look at them as three dimensional object on the ground and all around. And a lot of animals and insects start to fly. So this moment of explosion, I kind of conceive it as a, some sort of a moment of creation. And I often think about this um, moment of um, traumatic disaster. The ultimate one is the, the Big Bang itself. It's the moment where new life and new possibilities are presenting themselves. And this kind of dichotomy and dualities that existing between creation, destruction and creation. And obviously in this work, the moment of destruction is becoming the moment of creation, which I think constantly perpetually repeating in every experience that we have of life. So this idea that the insects are coming out of this moment where something is being annihilated and new possibilities kind of um, is blooming. Thank you, Ori. Um, it's really, I think, most crucial to, to emphasize that both in your work as in Timor's work, the presence of the viewer and the walking about the vicinity of uh, where the work is established 
affects the way the work uh, operates and, and you can, um, it affects the, the explosion in your work and it, it uh, definitely affects the uh, biome that uh, you're immersed in, in Timor's work. So Timor, you're welcome to present your work. Hi everybody. Uh, first, thank you um, for the Royal Garden for the invitation to talk here and thank you for to Hadas and, and Michael for bringing me onto the project in the first place. And Ori, thank you for your really fascinating lecture. It was really interesting to see that. Um, so let's see, I have a little slideshow that I'm repurposing, repurposing from, from previous lectures. But um, just to give you a little bit of a background for, my, for me and my work, uh, my name is Timur Sitchin. I'm based in New York. Uh, I'm German. I was born in West Berlin, and but I'm half. I'm my mother is German, and my father is ethnic Mongolian uh, from China. This is me and my grandmother, uh, my China, my Mongolian grandmother in West Berlin, um, before the wall came down. This is us at Tiananmen Square in '88, uh, and my cousin. And then at some point my mom remarried and she married a Native American man and we moved to Arizona. And so I grew up in, in the American Southwest. Um, so here's just a, some running through some pictures of previous works. Um, this is a sculpture series that I uh, made from the 3D scanned um, trees of bur uh, burned trees from one of the major forest fires in California in 2017. This is, this is on the High Line. Uh, this is a permanent installation and in Beijing. Um, these, this is a uh, Berlin Biennial 2016. Uh, here's another kind of temple, rock temple that I made in Basel a few years ago. Um, and here's some early work. I was very interested in sort of the morphogenesis of visual culture. Um, and here's some further early works. And so branding, uh, you know, and the visual, the, the, the uh, aesthetics of marketing and branding feature prominently in my work, but it, for me, it's a way of kind of approaching the human and human culture from a post-anthropocentric perspective and kind of thinking of, of it in terms of uh, a larger nature. Um, so these are, yeah, I, you know, a lot of renderings, 3D, 3D renderings of nature. Um, and I made a VR work as well, which is basically like a, a video essay where you're floating through this landscape. And then here are some more physical sculptures of mine um, that are made from 3D scans, usually photogrammetry. Of, of objects and then 3D printed. Um, and then as you can see, or here's some of the process you can see. Uh, and then I do a lot of light, light boxes as well that are digitally rendered, syn synthetically generated landscapes and, and uh, plants. Um, this is a show that I did in DC in 2020. Uh, and so there's this, this um, series of scanned, 3D scanned trees that I'm doing. Uh, this is a, from a tree in Peru. And some plexiglass pieces. Uh, <clears throat> this is another light box. This is all digitally generated um, landscape based on Northern Arizona. Uh, here you can see a picture of the real tree that I that I scanned, uh, and you can see the size of it. It's you know much bigger, of course. 
Um, here's my planning process. This is a tree uh, that was scanned in Georgia O'Keeffe's ranch in New Mexico. And this is presented in, in Bay Daihe in China at the UCCA Dune Museum. You can, here you can see the original tree and this is the 3D print. Um, and this is uh, a piece that I just presented in Saudi Arabia at the biennial there in December. And this is a tree that I scanned in Romania. And this is actually the, tr uh, I found this tree next to um, this temple, which is the temple that I scanned for the work, for, uh, for the work here um, for the botanical garden. Um, for seeing the invisible. So this was a sort of a Neolithic uh, site or a, a site that has been, that dates back to the Neolithic and then has been continuously sort of modified and, and lived in through the ages by different civilizations. Uh, really amazing stone, stone dwellings. Um, and then there was this tree, which was, you know, looked like it had only died uh, recently within the last couple of years and it fell over in this really dramatic way in front of this temple and um uh and it wasn't a a beech tree and the whole area is a beech tree forest and beech beech forest i think they release some sort of chemical in the ground that prevents other species from growing uh so and this tree was not a beech tree which makes me think that it was it would must have been planted by a human and sort of you know facilitated by a human some several hundreds of years ago but in the in i saw this i encountered this in 2020 uh in the summer of 2020 in kind of the height of the corona pandemic lockdown time and and it really felt uh you know symbolic of of the state of the natural world at the time um yeah here's the tree falling over so yeah, this is a rendering of the of the of the work from from Saudi. Uh, here's the, the raw rendering you can see, um, and then these are just some various three D renders. And I try to be you know super precise about the species and 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 exactly what the what the um, what the plants look like. This is a um, based on upstate New York. And sometimes you can see uh, the process involves also going into VR and sculpting, you know, tiny little details in VR to be as photorealistic as possible. Uh, this is uh, a scene, this is based on a landscape in Latvia. Um, and some random renderings. This is a, this is a sketch for our piece, um, and some beech tree renderings. Uh, here's some renderings for, for the botanical gardens work, and so with this, I you know uh, with this work in particular. Um, biome gateway for me you know i'm really fascinated how you can bridge the natural spaces between different places and um so you know the desert in northern arizona uh is very you know magical place and i love this idea that you can you know first you discover this sort of romanian neolithic stone temple and then you walk through it and then you enter in, in, uh, in a high desert environment. And I, and I love that, that you can bridge those different biomes. And, you know, it's sort of symbolic of how all of, you know, all of the natural spaces in the world are really connected to one another. Uh, yeah, here's some further just renderings and some process of some thistles. 
Uh, you know, perhaps it would be worthwhile for me to present the video of the work so the viewers can get a sense of it. Yeah, I think it's a good time. Uh, let me just show real quick. There's a few slides left. These are just the photogrammetry process. You can see you, I can scan these surfaces and then work with them uh, in 3D. And um, uh, it's, and how these plants are made as well. And some painting experiments, there we go. <laughs> okay, now we can go to the video. So, Let me see, how do I stop sharing? Okay. Wonderful, and we'll go right into So this is how the piece is established uh, when the viewer sees it up front, and this is the part of the experience of walking into it. I have yet to be able to try it myself because I haven't made it to one of the botanical gardens. But I hope to do so before I do. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Ori. Thank you, Timur. Thank you very much. Thank you.